Thank you, Dr. Peter Holm Green, for your kind introductions. It motivates me to do more in the years to come to protect our forests and our environment. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace be upon us all. Your Honor, Dr. Peter Holmgren, Director General of C4, Excellencies, Ministers and Ambassadors, Heads of International Organizations, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. First of all, let me express my appreciation to C4, the Center for International Forestry Research and the Indonesian Ministry of Forestry for organizing this important summit. I am particularly pleased to learn that more than 100 youth are participating in this auspicious occasion. Your participation shows that we do share similar dedication to preserve our natural environment. This is a testament of your readiness to solder the noble goal of safeguarding our tropical forests. As I look around this room, I am glad to see the comprehensiveness of participants. I noticed that over the years, from one conference to another, that I have the opportunity to address, the numbers of participants continue to grow. I can see ministers and senior officers responsible for forestry. I also see development specialists, researchers, and academics. And we have among us community representatives and the private sector. Truly, what brings us together is our patience and enthusiasm to protect our environment. I am pleased that this enthusiasm is also shared by peoples in Southeast Asia. More countries in the region are adopting sustainable development and green investment practices. Pro-environment policies are increasingly visible in government's development strategy and private sector's plan. In fact, pro-environment policies are part of Indonesia's four-pronged development strategy that includes pro-growth, pro-jobs, and pro-poor. With this strategy, we are striving to achieve sustainable growth in line with a vision of a green economy. And one of the new green policies in Indonesia is a nationwide program to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and to enhance our carbon stock. To that end, we are reforming our forest management to a higher level of sustainability. We are also increasing the number of planted trees and prohibiting the clearing of primary forests and lands. As a result, trees are taking root and forests are gaining more foothold. In 2011, I signed a moratorium of new utilization and conversion licenses to protect more than 63 million hectares of primary forests and peatlands. This is an area larger than the landmass of Malaysia and the Philippines combined. Last year, I extended the policy until 2015. I am hoping that my successor can further prolong the, uh, policy of morat of this policy of moratorium. Through this, we have lowered our deforestation rate from 1.2 million hectares per year between 2003 and 2006 into 450 and 600,000 hectares per year during the moratorium period in 
until 2013. And therefore, we managed to reduce 211 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year from the business as usual projections. In the last four years, we have planted more than four billion trees. If you have any doubt, I welcome you to start counting them. <laughs> but don't lose your counting tracks so you don't start counting again from the beginning. A success story in adopting a pro-environment policy can also be seen in the village of Loncha, central Sulawesi. For generations, Loncha villagers practice slash and burn land clearing. For many decades, this was the only method they know. This practice stopped after the introductions of a community-based program to manage forests and watershed area. The community is now aware of the dangers of slash and burn techniques. Besides releasing carbon into the atmosphere, it also destroys habitat and threaten ecosystem. Furthermore, the techniques may expose the villagers to greater risk of starvation. And now, Lonka farmers, I should say, Loncha farmers plan on a permanent plot of land. They know how to alternate between crops and ensure land fertility. Similar stories can also be found throughout Indonesia. After joining a farmers' union and obtaining a community forest permit, hundreds of farmers from Gunung Kito Regency in Yogyakarta are now managing 115 hectares of land in a sustainable manner. Among giant thick trees, they plant medicinal plant and crops for animal feed. In Konawe Selawatan, South East Sulawesi, Villagers form a partnership with a global NGOs to deliver internationally certified forestry products. And they do this from plot of land they own and manage. These communities and many other similar community-based organizations are now at the forefront of sustainable forest management effort. They are planting tree seedlings instead of cutting trees down. They work on a plot of land instead of the unsustainable practices of recent past, slash and burn and move. Alhamdulillah, these practices have been weeded out from those communities and sustainable land use has now taken root. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, despite those heartening achievement, more remains to be done. There are still many cases of unsustainable land use practices. Forests and peat lands of Southeast Asia continue to decline and degrade. In Riau province, Sumatra, for instance, despite all preventive measures taken by the provincial stakeholders over the years, forest fires still occur from time to time. I personally witnessed the forest fires there and the devastating effect to the local people and neighboring provinces. As the local government failed to mitigate, to mitigate the dire situation caused by the fires, I took immediate steps. I deployed disaster relief missions in Rio, coupled by strong law enforcement actions. The mission itself involved military and civilian personnel. Following these measures, over a hundred individuals and a dozen corporations are facing court trial for forestry related crimes, crimes that cause humanitarian and, env and environmental disasters. This legal message sends a firm message burning land and forests, logging illegally, and farming on illegal plantation, either by individuals or companies, will not be tolerated, nor left unpunished. Real forest fires give us many lessons. It was a man-made disaster. 
that disrupted the lives and damaged the health of ordinary law-abiding villagers, town folks, and communities. The haste paralyzed transportations and communications vital to daily lives and services that businesses depend on, and it prevents children access to schools and education. The two constructing cases of the Loncha community and the Riau province further convey us that forestry governance must be strengthened. This involves accurate forest mapping for conservation and sustainable land use. Through this initiative, we will have a unified map for Indonesia to help settle competing claims to land. And I should say, at the same time, we will able to better reduce deforestation and improve the productivity of our natural landscape. Another effort to strengthen forestry governance is the recent establishment of the Red Plus Agency. Ladies and gentlemen, forest management is a cross-cutting issue, and not only about keeping the trees. It is about striking a balance between the need for conserving the environment and guaranteeing the rights of local communities over their customary forests. By doing so, we provide them with the means to improve their welfare and economic progress. And this is indeed in line with Indonesia's development strategy of sustainable growth with equity. The central tenet of this strategy is about creating prosperity for everyone in a way that does not harm the natural environment upon which we all depend. I am also pleased that the idea of sustainable growth with equity has been reflected in the final outcome document of the high-level panel on the post-2015 development agenda. I do hope that upon the acceptance of the report by the UN General Assembly, the idea will become part of development policies of UN member countries. Starting next year, we will begin the discussions of the post-Kyoto Protocol process. We will also see the beginning of the implementations of the post-2015 development agenda. I believe sustainable forestry will become a critical part of these two processes. Many hope that the post-Kyoto process will recognize the true value and contribution of forest landscape, their economic, social, and environmental values. In this regard, Indonesia and other Asian countries must ensure that the upcoming climate negotiation in Lima, Peru, give particular attention to this matter. With this in mind, I am convinced that our gathering today is pertinent. As the team makes it clear, we do need sustainable landscape for green growth in Southeast Asia. History has recorded sad stories of environmental destruction from excessive exploitations of natural resources. Even some island countries have lost a part of their territories due to sustainable, unsustainable mining practices. We must be mindful that in the rush to develop and to quickly reduce poverty, we often give fewer consideration on sustainable development. It is no coincidence that in the drive for industrialization, countries produce greenhouse gas emissions at a higher rate. Even today, according to the recent report of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, emissions of greenhouse gases are continuing to rise to an unprecedented level. The report also underlined that the world has not done sufficient effort to curb emissions. In a broader context, we already see the adverse impact of climate change on our life, from the killer heat waves in Europe, wildfires in Australia, deadly floods in Pakistan, and fatal Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. 
In the case of Indonesia, more than two-thirds of the country's greenhouse gases emissions come from deforestation, peatland fires, and degradation. And therefore, our, our commitment to fight deforestation and peat degradation is our significant contribution to the global effort in mitigating climate change. Forest protects us against climate change. Indonesia is the world's second longest expanse of mangrove and the largest area of tropical peatland that store enormous amount of carbon. Keeping them intact is essential for averting the worst impact, the worst impact of climate change. But of course, Indonesia cannot do it alone. This is also the reason why Indonesia seeks international support, including to ensure that that we only treat certified forest products. Ladies and gentlemen, within the next 15 years, the population of ASEAN member countries is projected to increase by 84 million people. This means that there will be more demands for housing, transportation, and of course food and energy. If left unchecked, this will put more pressure on the environment. I believe the citizens of ASEAN do not wish to follow the self-destructing path of development. Therefore, I also call upon governments in Southeast Asia to continue developing a regional strategy, a strategy to increase their adaptive capacity and to promote a low-carbon economy. I also urge businesses across the ASEAN region to commit to sustainable land use and investment practices. This is the same call that I made three years ago to Indonesian business leaders. At that time, I urged them to partner with the government in enhancing environmental sustainability. I call on the citizen, civil society organization, research centers, think tanks, and academia to strengthen and develop their partnership, a partnership to achieve a more sustainable forest management practices. I invite our partner countries to continue supporting Indonesia's Red Plus program and go beyond carbon. And to the youth who will inherit our planet, let us continue working together. Let us ensure that your generation, as well as future generations, enjoy a green and sustainable environment. Before I conclude, I wish to leave you with a parting thought. What we do today is not for our own benefit. It is more for the billions of people who will inherit our earth. Therefore, the responsibility is upon us who live today to protect and save our forests for our children's children. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the opening plenary session of Forest Asia Summit 2014.